and acetylcysteine is on the chopping block. It's going to get banned, or at least it's looking like it's going to get banned. So why is this the case? What happened? N-acetylcysteine has been used as a supplement for decades. Like, why all of a sudden? Well, I'll give you sort of the spoiler here. If you say dumb things in your marketing, it's going to happen. Like, if you say things that attract attention because they're just things that shouldn't be said, they're outlandish, then yes, guess what? You put yourself on the radar. So I'm not exactly surprised. First off, what is N-acetylcysteine? We'll go through a little bit of biochemistry. We'll talk about kind of the history and then we'll get into the whole FDA piece. N-acetylcysteine is a precursor to what is called glutathione, which I'll touch on in a minute as well, okay? So glutathione is a, like a master antioxidant, very important antioxidant that is created in our body, okay? But it is created from three amino acids. It's created from cysteine, from glycine, and from glutamic acid, okay? So the thing is, is cysteine is the amino acid that is very important. It is called a rate limiting step. Without cysteine, you can't go through the process of actually creating glutathione. So it's rate limiting, okay? So what we have is something called N-acetylcysteine, which is the supplement form of cysteine, which will drive up cysteine levels within the body. That's the whole idea here. It's not about NAC itself, it's about trying to indirectly drive up what's called glutathione. Now, when you look at most glutathione supplements, pretty much all of them, they're relatively ineffective, okay? And they also don't cross through the blood-brain barrier, so you don't get the same actual effect that you would of like a sort of a bioidentical, like a real glutathione that's produced in your body, okay? And acetylcysteine is interesting because it can cross through the blood-brain barrier. The bottom line is, I don't want to discount how N-acetylcysteine works, okay? And we'll talk about how it does work in just a minute because it really is pretty effective in its particular use cases, specifically like what it was originally designed for uh, when it was like brought to market as a drug. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a second. After today's video, check out our video sponsor, which is Thrive Market. They are an online membership-based grocery store. So if you wanna have like, I don't know, stock your pantry with things for paleo, or maybe you're doing AIP, like an autoimmune kind of thing, or any, they have foods for every kind of diet category, makes it refreshing. But the thing I like most about it is it's convenient. Okay, so when it comes down to convenience, I can't stand going to the grocery store and trying to find specific things that are going to work for me. I just don't have the time for that. It's a convenience thing. It saves me time. It gets delivered to my doorstep. I can spend time with my family, spend time with my kids, do what I want to do. But the prices are super competitive too. A lot of times I end up paying less through Thrive Market than I would at most grocery stores, which is awesome. Plus, if you use that link that's down below, there's a 25% off discount link. Okay, so you save 25% off your first order, then you will also get a free gift if you use the special Thomas DeLauer link down below in the description. So please do check them out. Okay, they're awesome, awesome. So here's what glutathione does. Okay, glutathione offers sort of protective benefits within our body. And remember, glutathione is created within our body. It's just this cysteine is required for it. And it warrants me explaining how this works because it's very important. Okay, glutathione, what it does is it donates an electron. Okay, and what I mean by that is it donates an electron when it sees a uh, free radical. Okay, so every time you go through energy metabolism or you eat, you have what are called free radicals. I'm sure you've heard of them before, like reactive oxygen species. Okay, and it's the job of our antioxidants to neutralize those free radicals, right? So what happens to neutralize it is glutathione donates an electron. Okay, it has an electron and it donates an electron to a positively charged invader, in this case, a reactive oxygen species, you know, oxidative stressor. So when it donates that electron, it neutralizes it. There you go. And then you can actually excrete it and get rid of it. So you can see how it's very important. It's a really cool process how it works. And if you want the like nitty gritty biochemistry on it, maybe I could do another video on it. But essentially, once that glutathione donates its electron, it pairs up with another glutathione that's donated its electron. And then they go through a process where they sort of turn into glutathione disulfide and back into glutathione reductase again. It's a really cool process. Anyhow, point is, is that glutathione reductase is a very important component just for daily life. So when you look at a supplement form of NAC, the general claims are like, oh, hey, cool, it's really powerful antioxidant, supports antioxidant capabilities within the body, which is a mild statement that could probably be okay. Well, now let's talk more about like what's going on in terms of the history of N-acetylcysteine. Because N-acetylcysteine was originally patented as a medicine in 1960, okay? It wasn't brought to market as a supplement. It was brought to market as a medicine. 
So, and then in 1963, it was first approved as sort of a respiratory drug in an inhalant form, okay? And then after that, it started being used in terms of like IV and even oral treatment for liver toxicity. So things like acetaminophen poisoning predominantly. So if someone were to take too much Tylenol, go to the hospital, they would administer NAC. And it had pretty darn good effectiveness when it came down to that. In fact, it's still used today in that kind of setting. So it was brought to market originally as a drug, okay, it, as a pharmaceutical. If you look at some of the studies on NAC, it's pretty cool too. In terms of the liver, there was a study that was published in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. Okay, this one took a look at subjects and it found that when given N-acetylcysteine, 86% of the subjects ended up having improvements in their liver health or reduction in liver damage. Okay, so that's, again, speaks accolades to what's going on in sort of a pharmaceutical like hospital setting. But then if we look at sort of the oxidative stress, the ROS or the antioxidant properties, it's pretty fascinating too. There's a study that's published in the Journal of Physiology and Biochemistry and also in Physiological Research that took a look at NAC in that capacity. They found that N-acetylcysteine supplementation upregulated antioxidant activity significantly after just eight days. And it ended up crushing oxidative stress by about 30%. That's pretty powerful. So you can see where the claims start to get built from this, okay? It has those properties because it's supporting glutathione function. Now, I want to get something out in the open first. I am a huge proponent of allowing your body to develop its antioxidant capabilities naturally. I do not like taking antioxidant supplements. I have never been a fan of that, and that's my personal stance on it. If you train hard, if you work hard, if you expose yourself to hormetic stressors, your body will upregulate its ability to deal with things, okay? Look at salmon, for instance. Okay, salmon swim upstream, they stress the heck out of their bodies, and you know what they do? Their bodies, as a result, produce much more of what is called astaxanthin. That's what makes a salmon pink or super red with like sockeye, right? So the more that they work hard, the more antioxidants they naturally produce. So I'm not saying that there aren't use cases for these kinds of things, for N-acetylcysteine, but I am saying you are much better off in Tom Stilauer's worldview to just train hard, do cold plunges, do saunas, work hard, eat foods that support this process in your body, and I personally think you're gonna have a lot less stress worrying about a banned substance or something like that. But now let's talk about why it's potentially getting banned, okay? First of all, NAC has been on the FDA's radar for a while, okay? It started kind of in 2010, they started looking at it. Okay, this happens a lot. Okay, it doesn't mean that something's gonna go away, it just means like, okay, we're seeing some people make some interesting claims. But then in July of 2020, the FDA sent out a bunch of warning letters to companies and marketers and supplement companies that were pushing NAC and being pretty darn aggressive, okay? Like pushing, saying it's good for hangover cures, it's good for the immune system, which Right now, it's probably not the best idea to go out and market something heavily for the immune system. Okay, if you say dumb things that you can't really back up without totally like extrapolating little bits and pieces from a bunch of studies, especially when you're selling an actual supplement, then you're gonna run into a problem. So it got it on the FDA's radar. That's what happened. Okay, they're not shooting it down. I'm not taking a stance one way or the other. I just, if you look at the data, you see what happens, okay? So then it gets kind of interesting. Then the FDA says, well, you know what? This product was actually brought to market as a drug, okay? It was originally a drug, okay? It was patented as a drug and it was used as a drug. And then for the last five decades or so, it's been sold and used as a supplement and we haven't really said anything, but the reality is it is a drug and this would by law be making this an unapproved drug as a supplement. And then when you take people that are making crazy claims and saying it's gonna cure their hangovers and things like that, well, yeah, okay, that's what's going to happen. Not saying, again, that you can't make a claim to sell a product, but when you start going too far and you start getting weird about it and the sheer volume of people in the supplement industry that are doing this kind of thing, yeah, no wonder it is now on the radar. But we have to ask ourselves the question, why was it permitted until now? Okay, one of the things you probably need to consider is are there ongoing clinical trials with this, okay? So think about it like this. If N-acetylcysteine has been used as a drug in a hospital setting for a long time, there's a very good chance that it is being investigated to be used as a pharmaceutical for some other kind of intervention, okay? If that is the case, then it would make sense that preemptively, the FDA may start to kind of clean up the supplement space if something is actually 
maybe going to be groundbreaking. Maybe there's going to be a pharmaceutical breakthrough utilizing NAC. And we can rain on that and get upset and say, hey, this is like, we shouldn't let that happen because we have it as a supplement. But if it starts getting really used for something productive and good, then if you have some pharma knowledge, you can kind of understand how that works. And maybe what's going to happen here is as a result of the ban, and as a result of the potential ban, I should say, and as a result of like more potential research going, there might end up being sort of a frenzy over who gets kind of the monopoly on NAC in the pharma world. So you kind of have to look at the business side of it. There actually was a clinical study that was published to clinicaltrials.gov that looked at a dendrimer form of N-acetylcysteine, which does tell us just by that, that there is something going on in the clinical setting, so pharma is looking at using it. Again, I'm not here to take a side, but let me give you the bottom line here. Stupid stuff was said, stuff that shouldn't have been said, plain and simple, by way too many people, okay? Secondly, we don't necessarily know what's going on, okay? Thirdly, unfortunately, they're kind of within their rights to say that it was a drug before a supplement, which again, I'm not saying that that's cool, but I am saying that like that is the bureaucratic red tape and that is how the law is written. So that kind of makes sense. If they want to fall back on that, they can. So we can't just, but then I guess the big question, and I, I'm not a political guy, I'm more of a <laughs> biochemistry guy. So let me just say this, is it really worth it? Okay, it's a supplement that plenty of us do fine without. It's not really driving up that much for us in terms of everyday life. And if you do continue to take it, you could potentially be making yourself it's kind of dependent on this exogenous thing. There's arguments that you don't develop a dependency, that exogenous, you know, NAC isn't going to trigger that. And I don't think it is because it's just an amino acid that essentially goes into the labral pool. But like as far as antioxidant upregulation in the body, I want my body to be resilient on its own without the use of exogenous things. That's why I'm not even a big fan of taking like vitamin C. I'm not even a big fan of that. I want my body to upregulate its own antioxidant properties. So sure, there's a lot of questions and we're seeing that Amazon has talked about like ripping all of the NAC off preemptively. Like they want to take it off the shelves or their digital shelves because they don't want to have to deal with the stress of a potential ban. So I guess my advice on this is if you like the stuff and you find it interesting, then sure, get it. See if you notice a benefit, but it's one of those things that you probably won't notice anything tremendous. It might be something that is just not worth stressing over. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.